Okay, my name is Philip Hanston, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, Stoic philosophy. The originator of Stoicism was a Greek called Zeno. There's a couple of Zenos, so be sure to get them straight. Uh, this Zeno was uh, a bit after Socrates and Plato. He overlapped uh, maybe a decade or two with Aristotle. He did use some of, of uh, Socrates' ideas in the Stoic philosophy, um, but came up with a lot of new stuff uh, himself. Chrysippus was another uh, of the early Greek uh, philosophers. This is the Stoa, uh, which uh, when I was in Athens, uh, I was very excited about that they had just found uh, where the, the Stoa was, which is, uh, it's a painted colonnade, and this is the, where the term Stoicism came from, or the Stoic philosophy. So needless to say, it's at a rudimentary level of excavation, but I'm hopeful that they will uh, continue to do that. There's a difference between the Greek and the Roman Stoics. Uh, the Greek Stoics' writings, uh, most of them are gone. They're only referred to by other people. Uh, they were more theoretical. They were interested in physics and, and logic and that kind of thing. Ethics, too, but they, were, they uh, focused a lot on the, the physics part of their philosophy. Whereas the Roman Stoics, the people that we're going to be talking about, uh, were much more into ethics and and really how to live your life, uh, which is really the, the value that Stoic philosophy has for us today. The influence of Stoicism is widespread, even uh, still today. Uh, the ancient world was steeped in it. Uh, you were just assumed to understand so Stoicism uh, in ancient uh, Greece, at least later ancient Greece, and in uh, ancient Rome. Uh, and the fingerprints of Stoicism are, are really everywhere, even yet today. Uh, there's indeed a, a uh, psychology uh, school of thought uh, that was uh, promulgated by Dr. Ellis uh, where Stoicism is an essential part of the, of the therapy that uh, these people use. Uh, it had a major impact on Christianity. Uh, the early Christians were very fond of Stoicism. And um, speaking of religion, Stoicism is compatible with virtually any religion you can think of uh, and oftentimes is used as uh, something to complement uh, religion. In the past, uh, most philosophy uh, classes uh, talked about Stoicism and also Epicureanism and uh, skepticism and those types of schools of thought, uh, but they're, they're not real complicated and I think that's, you know how we professors love stuff that's arcane and complicated. I don't know if that's the reason, but uh, today, if you look in philosophy departments, uh, there's not a lot of focus on, uh, in most of them at least, on uh, Stoic philosophy. Seneca was one of the early uh, philosophers, and uh, Seneca wrote uh, a number of, of books. Uh, this is the Penguin version. Um, there are collection, various kinds of collections of, of uh, books uh, by Seneca. Uh, Letters from a Stoic uh, by Seneca, also very interesting, uh, that's, that has become more popular of late, actually. So, uh, lots of writings from Seneca in a variety of, of different kinds of compilations. Uh, Seneca was born in Spain, uh, of, in nobility. Uh, he was a statesman in Rome. He then traveled to Rome and was a statesman and an orator. Um, he was exi exiled. Uh, he was accused of adultery with the, uh, the emperor's sister. Uh, it may well not have been true. It doesn't really fit very much with uh, Seneca's uh, method of behavior, but uh, nonetheless he was uh, exiled. came back to Rome and then he realized how bad things were and he really tried to get out of, of uh, being involved with Nero and, and uh, being involved as a statesman, but uh, Nero wouldn't let him stop. So uh, he was later then accused of, of treachery or treason against Nero, and probably falsely again, and um, had, was forced to commit suicide. And uh, the accounts of his suicide show, actually, are, are a good example of uh, the value of Stoicism in, under uh, that kind of duress. Epictetus was another uh, of the Stoics. Uh, again, his books are, uh, are the Discourses, and we'll talk about this later, and also a sort of a Cliff Notes version, which is uh, the Enchiridion. 
uh, Epictetus uh, was born in Hierapolis, uh, which is uh, in, in current day Turkey. If you've ever been to the uh, Pamukkale, where those beautiful uh, calcium rich uh, um, structures that uh, where the water was full of calcium and made these beautiful white uh, structures in the streams, uh, that's where you were. Uh, Epictetus went to, to uh, Rome as a slave, so here he is at the opposite end of the socioeconomic spectrum from Seneca. Seneca was very wealthy and a nobleman. Uh, Epictetus was a slave, so uh, Stoicism really appealed to uh, people at, uh, at all levels. Uh, oh, and he also studied under Musonius Rufus, who is, uh, was one of the uh, famous uh, Roman uh, Stoic teachers. Uh, he lived a life of great simplicity. Uh, again, uh, he didn't have much money, and he didn't care about money. Uh, some of the other Stoics uh, were quite the opposite. And here's, here's one that's quite the opposite. One of the most remarkable humans that has ever lived, Marcus Aurelius, uh, a, the best example of a philosopher king than, that most people can uh, come up with. A uh, remarkable individual. He was the emperor of Rome. Uh, during the time that he was a uh, Stoic. Uh, here's a bust of him. Uh, it's in remarkably good shape because uh, it was buried in mud for millennia before they discovered it. Um, he was born uh, to an upper-class family, like uh, Seneca was, uh, in Rome. He was orphaned early, but then uh, adopted by another uh, uh, noble family. Um, he had some of the best tutors in Rome, and here again, um, like Epictetus and like Seneca, uh, he was uh, he was given the Roman, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the Stoic philosophy at a very early age, and was really marinated in Stoicism. So I think that is one of the reasons why they were so effective later on in life in being able to apply Stoic principles to their uh, lives. He married Faustina, and they had five children. The only one that survived was this terrible guy, uh, Commodus. And if you saw the movie Gladiator, um, it actually, in the movie, a little poetic license there, they had Commodus killing Marcus Aurelius. That didn't happen. Marcus Aurelius died uh, of an infection, uh, probably. But uh, nonetheless, the way they depicted Commodus as being a complete uh, miscreant uh, was, in fact, the case. Uh, when the emperor died, uh, Marcus Aurelius became uh, emperor at the age of 40, and he had very bad timing because things had been going along swimmingly for Rome for quite a while, uh, fairly peaceful, uh, at least in, the, in Rome itself, uh, and everything went to hell in a handbasket when Marcus Aurelius, thank goodness he was a committed Stoic because uh, somebody else might have had more difficulty. Um, in 167 AD, uh, he went to the Danube. Uh, he frequently did this. He would go, uh, instead of just staying in the royal palaces, he would actually go out uh, where the campaigns were being held and uh, put himself uh, in harm's way uh, because he was uh, the emperor. That, again, is a, a stoic sort of uh, approach to life. Uh, and while in these melancholy swamps of the Danube uh, with the fog and the cold, uh, he kept, uh, he wrote Meditations, which was really a journal, uh, sort of reminders to himself about Stoic philosophy. And the uh, intent was, at least uh, apparently, the intent was that this would be destroyed when he died. But thank goodness uh, that was not the case. <laughs> so uh, he died in camp in uh, 180 AD, probably, as I said, of an infection. And his dying words were, weep not for me, think rather of the pestilence and deaths of so many others. So again, a typical uh, Stoic response. Now who was it that said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? Uh, Lord Acton. Uh, and the question I'm asking here, is this generally true? And I think anybody who has looked at history would agree that yes, in fact, uh, this is uh, sadly quite true for the vast majority of people who have power. Is it true of Marcus Aurelius? And uh, I think uh, there's unanimity of opinion that the answer is no, it was not true of him. Uh, he never uh, seemed to abuse his power. He did let a few things uh, continue that were already going on. But as far as abusing the power himself, uh, it just doesn't seem to have happened. And he ran across, uh, I mean, he dealt with people with equanimity, even people that were against him. 
uh, that he could have had uh, immediately executed, and he didn't do that. So what I'd like to do now is uh, go through some of the uh, essential Stoic tenets. What is it that the Stoics were promulgating, and why is it that it's so useful uh, to those of us today, uh, 2,000 years later? One of, one of their tenets was realistic expectations about life. You have to have realistic expectations about what life is going to offer you. Uh, the art of living is more like wrestling than dancing, said Marcus Aurelius, and what he meant by this is not pessimism, but realism. The Stoics were not pessimists. They, they get a bum rap that, uh, oh, they're just a bunch of uh, pessimists that don't allow anybody to have any emotions, and you just have to kind of curl up and and just take what comes, and that's uh, not at all the case. Um, but it is true that you have to have realistic expectations about what life is going to... It's not that life is bad, it's just a, that you need to be realistic about uh, what's going to happen. Uh, this is a Far Side cartoon. Uh, I don't know if this will show up very well on your, um, on your screen, but uh, God is throwing a number of things. There's the world there in the middle, and he's putting a lot of stuff, birds and insects and, and light-skinned people and dark-skinned people, etc. And this little jar that he, he's sprinkling on the earth right now uh, jerks. And his little thought bubble says, and just to make it interesting. So, um, the jerks are out there. There's no question about it. And one of the things that, uh, that all of the Stoics did, as far as I know, uh, I know certainly Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca did this, uh, what was called meditation in advance. And this is a quote from Marcus Aurelius. Begin each day by telling yourself, today I shall be meeting with interference, ingratitude, insolence, disloyalty, ill will, and selfishness, all of them due to the offender's ignorance of what is good and evil. Uh, and this harkens back, this ignorance of what is good and evil harkens back to Socrates, who felt that uh, people didn't knowingly do bad things to other people. It was ignorance that caused them to do this. I'm not sure I agree with that completely, but that was his uh, proposal. So if you start each day, and I, I can tell you I do do this, especially if I'm going to be driving or traveling, uh, I have disciplined myself to do this, and it is enormously useful. Because when that first person uh, cuts you off intentionally or does something uh, really nasty, instead of immediately getting angry, I immediately say, ah, Epictetus was right. Um, you should expect that, uh, that all of these things are going to happen to you in any given day. And then when they do, instead of getting angry, you start thinking about Epictetus. It's, it's a very useful uh, <laughs> way of solving that problem. Just like this juvenile bald eagle uh, who... All he wanted to do was wander around the tide flats and look for things to eat. Uh, and you have this jerk of a crow, no doubt a male crow, I don't think female crows would do something stupid like this, uh, picking at his tail feathers for no reason whatsoever. He wasn't trying to get the food, he was just doing it because he could. And out of camera shot here, there were three or four of his male crow friends who were uh, egging him on and saying, come on, come on, you can do it, just go take, see if you can get one of his tail feathers. So. The eagle needs to, he eventually, by the way, I took this picture and then he eventually did turn around and scare the crow away, but he couldn't get around fast enough to actually get the crow. So even eagles need uh, stoicism or stoic training. Resigned acceptance of fate. This is uh, also an enormously useful uh, approach. You have to accept that things uh, are going to go well for you or poorly for you, and many times this is just something that happens it's not something that you have orchestrated, either good or bad. What happens to you is a strand in the tapestry of primordial causation. They believed in this, Stoics believed in this, that uh, there was a, a lot of the, many things that happened were preordained by fate. Uh, whether it's true or not, it certainly does give one uh, a more, it gives one more equanimity in, in uh, dealing with life. The good man's only singularity lies in his approving welcome to every experience that the looms of fate may weave for him. So, love of fate, Nietzsche talked about this, amor fati, uh, it's, it's actually a quite useful uh, way to look at life. Okay, we'll uh, stop here and we will go on to, uh, we will pick this up on the next uh, YouTube.